In this video, we're going to look at putting our core montage techniques together to create a simple two image montage. And the two images I've chosen is this textured background here. It does look like a piece of wood, but in fact, it was rock on a beach. And this image here. It's probably worth mentioning that we can use any version of Photoshop to create a montage. They've all got the ability to provide us with those core tools and techniques that we need to use and any version of Elements. If you're using an earlier version of Elements where you may not have the ability to create layer masks then you need to save more regularly but you can do exactly the same work by using your eraser tool. One of the hardest parts of making a montage is selecting the right images. I don't think it matters how much experience you have, from time to time you'll select an image that just doesn't work. I think that's when you need to be pretty strong and tough with yourself and say, this image has got to go, even sometimes when you think it's a great image to use. If it doesn't work within your montage, then it just has to go. I'm going to choose these two images, so I'm going to open them up into Photoshop and start the two layer montage process. So one of the core techniques is to make a layered stack of, in our case, the two images we wish to use. So it makes sense that if this image is going to be the main subject of interest, and this one is going to be the background texture that we drag this one over the top of this one. So to do that let's select that first and drag it from the top of the screen. In Photoshop Elements you do this slightly different especially in the later versions of Photoshop Elements there is a photo bin at the bottom of the screen open that up and you can drag the thumbnail from one image to another. Once we can see both of the images, we need to go to the toolbox on the left hand side and if you haven't already got it selected, select the Move tool. Go back to the image you want to drag and drop, click inside the window just to make the window live, then click, drag and drop. You'll see the image appear on top of the texture so we can shut the original down because we've now got both of these images in a layered stack. There's one and there's the other. Just in case you're wondering, the reason this image is smaller than the image beneath is simply because this is taken on a lower resolution camera so it's not quite so large. With the Move tool still selected, I can click into this image and I can move it into position. I could, if I wanted to, increase the size of it, but I don't think I really need to. It's big enough to do what I want. What I'd like to do next is to go back into my Layers palette because I'm going to combine this layer, which is the main subject, with the textured layer beneath, but I want to use one of these drop-down blend modes. The problem as you can see is there's rather a large number of them. Many of them are not very effective, so I'm going to leave you to go down each of these in turn and see what effect they have on the image. You see I've just selected Dissolve and there doesn't seem to be a great deal of difference, but there is when we select something like Darken. Now, the core ones of these, which tend to work for the majority of the time, will be Darken, Multiply, Overlay, Soft Light, and Hard Light. So those are the ones we're probably going to dwell on most throughout the tutorials in this category. But I'm going to take you to just those few core blend modes first. So there's the Darken. There's Multiply, there we have Overlay, Soft Light, and Hard Light. So the first choice we've got to make is which one of those 
are we going to use? Well, I suppose I could say that's a good question, because we don't really know, do we? We choose as individuals what appeals to us, but we need to be careful here, because when we first blend two images together, we mustn't be too fooled by what we first see. We've got to sort of learn to interpret there's a possibility of getting whatever we see better. I'm going to go back and take a look at that darken. Then I'm going to look at multiply. I quite like the look of multiply, but the image is going very slightly dark. So I'm going to try to see if I can fix that by using one or two other techniques which I hope will vary what we see on screen. Remember, we need to start saving our file as soon as we've made two layers into a stack. So I'm going to do that now, saving this as my two layer montage, and I'll just give it a number and start off with one. Now we need to make a start in saving our image at some point, and this is a logical place to start, because at the moment I've got two layers saved as a Photoshop file, and I've called it two layer montage one. So I can now start making changes to both of these layers, safe in the knowledge that if I take the wrong track and it goes bad, I can just drop them in the bin and I can go and get my previous two layers. The changes we make to one or any number of layers in a montage is going to be partly a personal choice. I think it's also going to be driven by things that we try and things that work and things that don't work. And also, there's a part of calculated guesswork. The more we make montages, the better we seem to get at being able to determine what's more likely to give us a result than not. One of the main issues in montages that give us a problem is if we're not entirely sure what we need to do next and how that's going to affect the image, which is almost all of the time in a montage, then we're constantly trying something and then backing away from what doesn't work. To make all that much easier to handle, we can do a couple of things. Firstly, if you're using Photoshop Elements and earlier versions of Photoshop, you need to make sure that you save various different versions of your montage as you go through the process. So we've saved ours as version 1, and at some stage we may create 2, 3, 4, or as many as we need. That always allows us the ability to sit back, reflect on what we've done, and if we decide we've done something wrong, we can back up and go back to a previously saved version. If you're a user of Photoshop CS5 and CS6, I'm not sure if smart objects were a part of CS4. They probably were. My memory will not allow me to remember back that far now. But if I go to my layers here, I'm not likely to make a change to this layer, but I may want to make a change to this one, particularly the size of the layer. So before I start adjusting any size, what I can do is right click to the right of the thumbnail and I convert this into a smart object. What a smart object allows me to do, if I was to bring up my free transform tool, and I've just done that using Control T, firstly you've got a little icon at the bottom right of the layer to tell you you've now got a smart object and this is slightly different as well this crisscross effect it does mean that I can make this image very small but I can also come back later on and drag the image back to its original size without any loss of quality now until we're absolutely certain we don't want to change the size of that image that's a good option to take advantage of now once I make a layered stack and I've selected the blend mode I believe is going to lead me down the right route to a good image, then generally I do something with the edges by using layer masks. But before I get to that, what I'd like to do, and it's just my experience now of making montages, I want to see what the image looks like with the background reduced to a monochrome. 
So I'm going to go to my layers and I'm going to select my background layer. And I'm going to have a look at that by going to Image, Adjustment, Black and White. Now I'll get that out of the way so we can see what we can see. I don't think it's going to be crucial which one of these presets that we use, although some are probably going to be too light or too dark. Green is usually a good option. Maximum black. You can see that there's none of these are making a great deal of difference to each other, but I think they're going to improve our montage. So for the moment, I'm going to click OK to accept that as a monochrome. So now would be a good time to save this as version 2. So I do have an escape route back to the color version without any difficulty. Now I'm going to have a look at maybe lightening this image here because it's a little bit dark and I wonder what it would look like if I try to lighten it. So I need to go back to my layers and I need to select the layer. Now, one of the ways I like to lighten an image, I usually work on the mid-tones of my levels. But look what happens when I try to do that. If I go to Image, Adjustment, all of the options are greyed out. And the reason they're greyed out is because I changed my image into a smart object. So, already, having only just created the smart object, it's giving me a little bit of a problem because I feel the need to back away from it but I can have my cake and eat it here. What I'm going to do is make a copy of that layer. Control J will do that. Ignore what it's just done to the image because I'm going to turn that layer off and if you like, this layer is my insurance. This is the layer I'm now going to work on and it gives me the opportunity to show you that if you want to remove the smart object status, go back to the right of the thumbnail, right click, and choose Rasterize Layer. So now when I go back to my image menu and choose Adjustments, the levels are available to me and I'm going to have a little play around with these and see the effect of the levels on the layer containing the horse and cart and the texture beneath. This is the mid-tone slider so I can brighten this. Not too keen on that there's always an option to return this palette to its standard setting. Just hold the Alt key and you'll notice the Cancel button changes to a reset, so we can click back. So if the mid-tone doesn't give me a result that I find attractive, I can try the light tone slider. Now that's looking better. I'm enjoying the way the textures are now coming through from the image beneath but I'm still losing a lot of detail in the main subject here but I think we can put that back a little bit later on. I'm going to click OK to accept that change. I suppose another alternative is to look at the image with the horse and cart as a monochrome too. If you want just a quick look here's a little shortcut Control Shift U and it removes all of the colour. But if you don't like that, Control Z is the undo key. I think I'd prefer to have a little bit of colour, or that's what I'm thinking right now. So let's deal with the square edges around the edge of the horse and cart by going back to our layers and applying a layer mask here. We're going to keep this one up our sleeve just for a little while. So down to the bottom left of the layers, click to create the mask. Go to your toolbox. We need to select black as our foreground colour. I'm going to select a soft edge brush. Don't need it quite that big, so I'm going to use the square bracket keys to the right of the letter P to drop the size down to something like that. And I'm going to drop the flow rate down to about 10%. With this little icon checked, I can drop this down using the number keys on the keyboard. So I've just hit the number one key. Now if I go down to the left hand side, I'm going to move my brush left and right because it makes a little bit more sense in working that way. Now you can see how effectively I can blend in the edge of this. And once again, a large degree of 
personal choice on how much we do. You can see there's a straight edge down that building, which may look better if I blend it in. But remember, we're working on a layer mask. So if we did something like that, and we decided that it wasn't working as well as we thought, we can switch our color from black to white, and we can repair that. So we've got lots of foul safes now. But I actually did quite like it, so I'll take that away. Now I'm going to go along the bottom here to blend in that bottom line. It's always a good idea to start off with the flow rate of your brush fairly low, something like 10%, and build it up if you feel it's necessary. But more often than not, 5 or 10% is probably going to be about what you need to select. And that's a bit of a nuisance. Let's get rid of that little warning message that pops up. Why do your computers always want to tell you things when you're in the middle of some work? And now along the top, and we need to blend this in to a degree that we feel looks attractive. I think there's a bit too much color on the left here. So I'm going to drop my brush down. I'm going to drop the flow rate down even more to 5% by hitting 0, 05. And I'm just going to sweep my brush over that a little bit. Not much, but just a little. And we've got a little bit of red here, which I think could end up drawing our eye a little bit too much away from the horse and cart. So perhaps we can just lose that little bit there. Now that's not looking too bad, but we've lost a lot of the appeal of the horse and cart because although we're getting the charm of the montage, two layers and all of that, we're losing detail in the guy's face and I think we need to bring some back. So here's a way we can do that. What I'm going to do is go back to my layers because a few moments ago we made a copy of the layer and it's this one here. I'm going to turn that layer on but when I made a copy of this layer, it also copies the multiply blend mode that I used. So what I need to do is to select that layer. I want to return that back to its standard setting. Think about the layer mask just for a moment. If we can mask with black, and black will make parts of this layer see-through, then if I flood my mask with black on this layer, I can then paint with black and reveal pixels just where I want them. Probably best demonstrated than explained. So let me apply a mask to the right of that upper layer. But immediately let me flood the mask with black. The effect of that is going to be to mask this image completely from the layered stack. I'm going to use keyboard shortcuts here. Black is my foreground color in my color picker. If you look at the bottom of the toolbox on the left. So Alt Backspace we'll flood it with black. So now we're back to what we was looking at just a few minutes ago. So what have we achieved? Well, nothing yet, but what we've done, we've set this top layer up to reveal some more pixels just where we want them. If the black mask has taken away all traces of the pixels of this image, albeit temporarily, then if I switch to white, I can now spray white on my mask and reveal an original image just in the areas I want the pixels to appear. Once again, this is probably better demonstrated than explained. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to the guy because he is quite an important part of our montage. My brush is a little bit on the big side. So what have I got? I've got a black mask or a mask flooded with black. I've got white selected as my foreground color. I've got a soft edge brush. I've got a flow rate which has been set quite low at 5%. I can just about see the edges of the guy's hat. So as I mask over here and around the guy's face, I can start to bring back some detail in just the areas that I want. Making my brush bigger now for the front of the guy, just bringing back a little bit of detail. Not entirely, otherwise it won't look quite so nice. If I wanted, for example, to be able to 
see a little bit of the wording up there I could bring a little bit of that back if I wanted to and I can choose to do as much or as little as I want with the horses and the bulk of the image we're looking at so I could just bring through a little bit of detail here until in the end our montage starts to get a little bit more interesting remember we're working on a mask here so if at any time we change our mind and it's likely we will we can switch to black and remove any of the masking we've done keep the flow rate low so that you can make sure that you don't overdo things but remembering we're working with a mask all of the time it's not such a great problem as you can see the shape of the guy's hat is quite important to the image so what I've done with my mask here I've sprayed white onto the mask to reveal the color coming through here but now I've switched back to black I've zoomed in I've got a much smaller brush I've increased the flow a little bit because now I can take a bit of care and actually follow the edge of the hat sometimes with montages we can use a big brush and blend the whole sides of the image into another and that looks great but there are other times when we just need to be a little bit more specific and around the hat here is probably one of those so I'll just take the rest of that away and then we can zoom out and take a look and it's not looking too bad at all what also happens I find once you start to get creative with images in Photoshop or elements is we almost feed off of our own creativity and it's while I'm working and I'm looking at this image and I'm thinking to myself it's taking on almost a sepia tone which isn't unattractive so I wonder what the texture would look like in the background if I sepia tone that well I can do that with no risk at all I can hit control s control s is a good shortcut key it will always save over the top of the previously saved version I can go back to my layers I can select my background go into the menus at the top of the screen choosing image adjustment hue and saturation I need to tick the colorize box which is this one down here and in the hue I tend to like a sepia that's about 25 in hue and somewhere around anything between 8 and 12 8 doesn't look too bad 12 seems to balance much nicer with the image in front so you can see how if you like we're almost following our instincts following our nose to lead us to a picture that's got a little bit of charm and appeal here's another great tip but I'm not sure many of us follow this but at this stage if we save our image as a Photoshop file which we have it's not a bad idea to put it to bed and come back and look at this tomorrow because we tend to get a little bit fogged with our own creativity and we sometimes can miss the obvious I can see a couple of areas that I'd like to deal with I've got a bit too much color I think coming in down the bottom left to deal with that all I need to do is to select the appropriate layer it's the original layer we applied so we would need to be spraying black onto the background I can make my brush bigger I can drop that flow rate down to 5% once again so even now I've got the versatility to say I want to kill a little bit of the color there maybe a little bit top left a couple of uprights there which are a little bit annoying so I may take the brush down and actually go right the way down and try to remove those so we leave the guy a little bit more isolated and perhaps a bit stronger as the main center of interest a couple of other areas where the color is a bit high and these are the sorts of things that we could always do on another day but I think really do we follow our own good sense sometimes but there we have the basis of a pretty good montage I think but there's one or two things we can do I'm gonna to go to save this 
as version 3 and again it's a good point for me to do this because what I'm going to do next is to flatten all of those layers together. So go to the top right of your layers and I'm going to choose to flatten the image because what I want to do next needs all of those layers to be one. It is sometimes the finishing touches that can really make or break any image, particularly a montage. If we look at this image with a critical eye, we can see that the left hand side of our background is fairly light and the right hand is fairly light too. I could have left this in layers I suppose and adjusted just one side of that particular layer. But we're trying to keep this pretty simple, two layers, although we've used a copy of one layer to make three, but basically two images, that's what I really wanted to do here. Once I've got the image flat I can use one or two of the other tools in Photoshop. We've got quite a big area on the left hand side here, so perhaps a way to deal with that is to select our freehand lasso tool. I can draw a lasso shape, I'm going to draw an irregular shape along the area where I think is more or less the lightest part and along the top. What I can then do is soften the line that I've drawn down the image here by going to refine edge. We need this to be fairly soft. The view mode at the top of the screen here is just the way we can view the selection we've made but I find it more convenient to use black and white. It just lets me see the edge because I want to move the feather command and it's the edge I need to see because I need it to be very very soft. When I'm happy that I've got it soft enough, I can click OK. I'm going to hide that selection just so we can't see it for a moment, but it's still going to be there and working. Control H will do that, because I'm going to bring up my levels once again. And this time I'm going to just drop down the mid-tone slider, and you can see what I can do with the left-hand side of that image. It worked particularly well, so I could hit Control H to bring the level, bring the selection back, and then show you that Control D removes it. I could then use the same method to do the light areas around here. Irregular shapes I find are always better. Soften the edge once again. Control H will hide the selection. I'll bring my levels up with shortcuts this time. Control T, uh, Control L, beg your pardon, and just move that mid-tone slider. And you can see now we're darkening that down just nicely. Not forgetting though that you do have a hidden selection in place. So always remember it's there. Control D will remove it. Now I still think there's some areas that need to be subdued. I'm going to turn to my burn tool to do this. The burn tool will allow us to darken various tones in the image using a brush and using an exposure value similar to what we've used with the soft edge brush on the mask. We get the opportunity to select highlight, shadows or midtones. I think here we'll stay with highlights and I'll adjust the brush using the square bracket keys on the keyboard. And it's these highlights up here that I want to tone down. Can you see them just dropping down? It's a mistake to have the exposure much more than 10%. Anything more than that and the tool can start to run away with us. And we need it to be gentle basically. But all I'm going to do now is tone down areas where I believe the light tones could just do with a little bit of darkening. Not much, but they will make a difference. We've got some tones over here that can go down as well. Lastly, well almost lastly, if you've got any little spots or blemishes on the image, and sometimes when we make montages we will get one or two of these, move to your spot healing brush. Make an appropriate size brush and you can see 
I've got a couple of little marks here which are not significant, but light areas around the edge of the image, uh, image is not the best thing. So if we can deal with those, any little light mark that stands out that may distract our attention, we can give it a touch. We don't have to get too concerned with this, but we can certainly improve our image with a touch here and there of that brush. And lastly, what's occurred to me is perhaps I could just lift the color in the most strategic place on the image. And to do that, I can turn back to a tool that's grouped with the dodge tool and the burn tool called the sponge tool. And the sponge tool allows us to saturate an image. And once again, we've got a flow rate. And I'm going to try to see if I can just lift the color of the guy's shirt and maybe the barrel on the back of the cart so we draw attention to that point. But before I do, I think I'll just hit Control S to save over the previously saved version. Just in case what I do now doesn't work, I can just undo or go back to version 3. So all I want to do here is just tease up the color a little bit. Maybe we'll risk a bit on his face as well. But we've got some nice color in that barrel. And these colors will help to draw the eye. So what we're doing is emphasizing our center of interest. All of these little things are what we need to do when we're making a montage. And finally, I'm going to darken the edge even more. I'm going to show you another little technique that I've used a number of times on various images. Again, the freehand lasso tool. I'm going to make a new regular lasso shape around the outer edge. The bottom doesn't really need too much of this because it's quite dark as it is, but I doubt it's going to have or do any damage by applying an overall change to the top and the bottom. By making that selection, I've got the center part of my image selected. I want to just select the little bit around the outer edge. To do that, I can go to my Select menu and choose Inverse. Now I've got just this selected, and if you like, it's like selecting the outer edge and protecting the middle. But I need to soften the edge of my selection once again using the same tools we used a few moments ago. And it needs to be reasonably soft for what we're about to do. Possibly something like that. I want to flood that area with black and see how it looks. But I don't want to flood it with black on that particular layer. What I'll do is go to my layers and create a new blank layer by clicking at the bottom right of the palette. Go to my color picker, select black as my foreground color. I can flood my foreground color with Alt Backspace. Hit Ctrl D to remove the selection. And now the reason I put that on a separate layer was so I can use the opacity of that layer to temper the effect of that shading to get something which I feel is about right. Now that shading looks great along the bottom, up the right hand side and most of the top, but maybe it's a little bit deficient in this area over here. Here's how we'll deal with that. Pick up your brush. Make the brush fairly big, something like that. Drop the flow rate to 1 or 2% and just brush over that area spraying black. So what we're doing is we're just enhancing what we've just done a few moments ago. If 1 or 2% isn't quite enough, just increase it a little bit to 5%. You can see it's starting to have an effect now, but even that, I possibly can go a bit further, so I'm going to risk 10%. And I'm just going to darken these edges down a little bit, but I'm trying not to overdo things. And I think that's just about right. Once I'm happy with that, I've got that shaded area around the outer edge. I could decide to go to File, Save As and save this as yet another version. Just in case I do change my mind, I've got all these different versions, but at some stage, of course, we do need to say, 
I finish the image so I'll flatten all of those layers together and I think we're done.